All right. So we're going to continue tonight in our series on the Proverbs. We've been looking at the Proverbs and what the Proverbs can teach us about making wise decisions in life. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at some of what the Proverbs have to say about parenting. And for the last couple of weeks, we've mainly been applying one main proverb. And so I want to encourage you to to look with me one last time at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. This proverb says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Over the last two sermons, we've talked about four aspects of training up our kids in the way that they should go. We've talked about training them up to serve within the church. We've talked about training them up to share their faith. We've talked about training them up to be faithful under persecution. We've talked about training them up to know what to look for in a good spouse. Tonight will be the last sermon on parenting. So for those of you who are done raising your kids, thank you for your patience. Tonight is the last one on parenting. I appreciate it. I had someone right before the service who is fully done raising their kids who had asked me, uh, is this the last one on parenting? So we are talking about parenting for one more night tonight. Um, But tonight, we're going to talk about a subject that has become pretty controversial in our culture. We're going to talk about a subject that has become very contentious and very emotional. Tonight, we're going to talk about a subject that is dangerous to teach on and is on the verge of becoming illegal to even talk about within our society. Tonight, we're going to look at just some of what the Proverbs have to say about disciplining our kids. Now, the Proverbs, remember, deal with the nitty gritty of everyday life. And so it's not surprising that the Proverbs have a ton to say about the wisdom of parental discipline. And the honest truth is that I am pretty sure I would be chicken and unfaithful if I taught through what the Proverbs said and did not include a message on discipline because the Proverbs have so, so much to say about disciplining our children. Now, I myself am still in the process of raising my kids, and I'm still learning to. And I don't think I quite have all of it figured out quite yet, and I'm not sure that I always get it right. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to share timeless principles from God's Word, and I'm also going to share some good ideas that I've picked up along the way from good Christian parents who have successfully finish the job of raising their children. And the main point, I think, of what the Proverbs have to say about disciplining our kids is this, that if we are going to be wise parents, and if we're going to have wise kids, then we need to discipline our kids. So tonight, we're going to talk about three reasons why we should discipline our kids. The first reason is this, we should discipline our kids because we love them. Look with me in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. This proverb says, He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Now, our culture actually reverses this biblical order. Our culture says that the loving thing to do is to not discipline your kids and that the hateful thing to do is to discipline your kids. But what this proverb actually says is the exact opposite of what our culture says. This proverb says that disciplining our kids is the loving thing to do, and failing to discipline our kids is actually the hateful thing to do. Now, how could disciplining our kids be a loving action? I mean, we often sort of juxtapose those two things. We say, okay, there's love, And then there's discipline, but those aren't the same things we often think. But actually, this passage shows us that disciplining our kids is one way that we express love towards our kids. Now, how in the world could disciplining our kids be an act of love? Well, the reason is, is because love always puts the other person's needs in front of our own. And here's the truth. As parents, there's no one who likes disciplining their kids. If you like disciplining your kids, that's perhaps another uh, sermon for another day. Uh, But no one likes disciplining their kids. I mean, it's an unpleasant task that we wish we didn't have to do and would kind of rather 
avoid. In fact, there's a temptation as parents to be selfish and only think about our own needs and avoid disciplining our kids. But if we love our kids, then we're gonna do what's best for them, not what's easiest for us. Because that's what love is. Parental love is putting your kids' needs before our own. Now, in our modern culture, one of the things that sticks out very quickly about the proverb that I just read was the word rod. In our culture, that word rod sticks out pretty strongly. Verses like this is where we get our modern uh, phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child from. Now, we don't know exactly what this rod was. The Hebrew word rod can describe various wooden instruments of different sizes and different shapes. But whatever this rod was, it's pretty clear that this verse is obviously talking about some form of corporal punishment, some form of spanking. Now, throughout human history, and in most cultures on earth today, the proposition that a parent would not spank a child would be considered very unusual and perhaps even preposterous. And yet many of the supposed experts in our culture today would say that spanking in of itself is abusive. There are some countries that have even outlawed spanking. Sweden was the first country to outlaw spanking, and since then there's been about 50 other countries that have followed suit. So there's about 200 countries on planet Earth, about 50 of them have made spanking illegal. And of course, there are people in our own country who are constantly on a campaign to make spanking illegal here within the United States. So are they right? Is spanking abusive? Well, I definitely, without a doubt, believe that spanking can become abusive. And I often believe that it often does in families. But if we're careful, it doesn't have to be. I know that in my own life, I'm very thankful that my mom and my grandparents, by the way, spanked me. And it never once, not even once, ever became abusive. In fact, I honestly probably deserved more spankings than I actually received. Now, spanking should only be done carefully, thoughtfully, and lovingly. Let me give you some details of what that actually means. First of all, spanking should never be done in anger. If we as the parent are angry, then we need to send them to their room and wait until they've calmed down. If for some reason we can't calm down, then if we're married, we might need to ask that our spouse does the spanking in that situation. Another detail about spanking in a way that is careful, thoughtful, and loving is we should only spank in private, never in public. The goal of spanking is not to humiliate our kids. We should never strive to humiliate our kids. The goal is to correct their behavior. Another detail about thoughtful, careful, loving spanking is that that kind of spanking should only be on the bottom and never on any other part of the body because the bottom is the part of the body that God has blessed with the most cushion. <laughs> Another detail about careful, thoughtful, loving spanking is that it should never be so hard that it injures the child or leaves a mark. Those kind of things, or let me say this, that leaves a permanent mark. Those kinds of things are clues that we're in danger of crossing over into abuse. Another detail about careful, thoughtful, loving spanking is that there should be a process to spanking. There should be multiple steps to slow down the process and to regulate it. What am I talking about? Well, some parents, just the second something happens, snatch up their kid by the arm, yank him up in the air, and just start swatting him while they're dangling in the air. That is not careful, thoughtful, loving spanking. That is not spanking that has a process to it. Let me give you some examples of what a process could look like. First of all, that the child gets sent to a regular place. If they're at home, maybe it's always to their bedroom. Um, and then you wait until you're calm before you go in there. Secondly, when you get in there, you ask them if they know why they are getting a spanking. Thirdly, you explain what you're trying to do by disciplining them. That you're trying to help them because you love them. One time I was at someone else's house and their son, who was probably about six years old, came up to me and he looked right at me and out of nowhere he said, spanking gives me a happy heart. <laughs> and I knew that that was a boy whose parents were explaining to him 
the reason for discipline. And then afterwards, we should reaffirm our love for our kids. Now, sometimes people ask, well, Brian, if I start spanking my kid, aren't they just going to walk around terrified every second of every day that I might spank them? Not if you have a regular process. Another detail about careful, loving, thoughtful spanking is to remember that spanking is not the only form of discipline available to us. So I think there's two extremes in parenting. One extreme is when parents just rule out spanking that it could never possibly be an option. The other extreme is when there's parents who think the only option and the only form of discipline is spanking. But there are other forms of discipline in our parental disciplinary tool belt, right? Um, there are four basic types of discipline. There is positive physical reinforcements, like a hug, a gift, or no, some other reward. There are positive non-physical reinforcements, like a word of praise, or the granting of some privilege. There are negative physical reinforcements, like spanking or a timeout. And there are negative non-physical reinforcements, like reprimands, taking away privileges, taking away a toy, or maybe taking away devices. Now, the older kids get, the more parents should be using those other forms of discipline, and the older a kid gets, the less that parents should be relying on spanking. There comes a certain age in our kid's life, and it's different for probably each kid, but there comes a certain age in our kid's life where spanking would actually do more harm than good. And so as they get older, we need to phase that out. Now, whatever form of discipline we're using in the moment, what I want to do is I want to give you some best practices that I've noticed in parents that I admire over the years. So first of all, this. The parents that I look up to require their kids to obey the first time. This is often called first-time obedience. And first-time obedience is very different than what happens in most households. A lot of households is kind of like this. Let's say little Johnny gets mad at the dinner table, and so little Johnny takes his plate and throws it on the ground. So then the parent says, Johnny, that was bad. You need to pick that up. And Johnny goes, no. And so the parent says, Johnny, I'm serious. You need to pick that up. Mm -mm. Johnny, you need to listen to me. You need to pick that up right now. No? Johnny, I, I mean this. I really mean this. You need to pick that up. No. Johnny, don't make me count to three. I'm going to count to three, Johnny. Johnny, I'm going to count to three. Here I go, Johnny. You better listen. Johnny, here I go. One. Johnny, I'm serious. I've started counting to three. Johnny, I've said one. Don't make me say two, Johnny. Pick that up. Johnny, don't make me say two. All right, you made me do it. Two. Johnny, I'm almost a three. You better pick that up soon. I'm serious, Johnny. Two and a half. I, is this, this is for real, isn't it? Two and three quarters. Johnny, you better pick it up. I'm almost a three, Johnny. Don't maybe get to three, Johnny. Johnny, three. Johnny, I'm serious. You need to pick that up. And so for most parents, they don't require first time obedience if they're lucky. Maybe they require like 49th time obedience or maybe like 52nd time obedience, right? But what does that teach our kids? It teaches them they don't have to listen the first 52 times. And it teaches them they don't have to listen until we're screaming and at an atomic level of anger. The truth is, the parents that I've seen require first time obedience don't get to the screaming atomic levels of anger because they don't get to the 52nd time. They require obedience the first time. And if there's not obedience the first time, then there is some sort of discipline every time. Another best practice that I've seen with parents that I admire is that there are three things that we should discipline for. We should discipline for the three Ds, danger, defiance, and disrespect. Sometimes kids are doing something that's putting their life in danger or putting themselves in physical harm, like putting their finger in the electrical socket or something like that. There are times where they defy us. We tell them to do something, and they flat out don't do it. That is upright, straightforward, in-your-face defiance. And then there's sometimes where it's disrespect. A kid says something to their mom like, shut up, mom, I don't care what you said. Well, that is a disciplinal offense, you better believe it, right? Now, what we don't discipline for is we don't discipline for just being a kid. If you have a toddler who trips and knocks over the lamp, 
That may frustrate you, and you may not be happy about the money it's going to take to replace that lamp, but that's not a disciplinable offense because that wasn't danger, defiance, or disrespect. However, if they're teenagers and they're throwing the football in the house and you tell them to stop and they don't and break the lamp, that is disciplinable because that was defiance, right? You told them to stop. That's a different story. Now, another best practice that I've seen in parents that I admire is that our kids should know the consequences ahead of time. What that means, in other words, is that our kids should never be surprised that they're getting disciplined. They should only be disciplined for things they knew were wrong. Now, kids are crafty and they're tricky, and so they'll try to convince you that they didn't know it was wrong when we know that they did, right? Um, so you might say, Johnny, what were you doing? I, I told you not to hit your sister. And Johnny says, I didn't hit her, I kicked her. <laughs> now that's real life stuff, right? Don't raise your hand. But just ask if your kid has ever tried to pull that one on you, right? Um, another best practice that I've seen is that the punishment should fit the crime. You know, in, in American court we call this, um, uh, what do we call this? Well, not cruel and unusual punishment, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But that it should fit the crime. So they probably shouldn't get grounded for a month just because they didn't put their clothes in the hamper, right? It should be, um, it should fit the crime. That's all I'm trying to say. Another best practice I've seen with parents that I look up to is that parents should be consistent in their discipline. Sometimes us parents are so inconsistent in our discipline that our kids never know what to expect out of us, right? Sometimes we discipline differently when we're tired than when we're rested. Sometimes us parents discipline differently when we're stressed than when we're relaxed. Sometimes us parents discipline differently when we are late and in a hurry than we would have if we were on time and uh, early, right? Um, sometimes as parents, we discipline differently when we're hangry than when we have a full stomach. But discipline should not be a matter of, our, of our, what happens to be our emotional state at that moment. Discipline should not be a matter of what mood we're in or how tired we are. Discipline should be a settled, decided matter of what's best for our kids. Another best practice that I've seen in parents that I admire is we need to take our kids' personality into consideration when we're disciplining them. Some kids are more sensitive. Some have stronger personalities. Some respond better to some kinds of discipline. Some respond better to other kinds of discipline. Now, I'm not saying that any of that is an excuse to not discipline them. There have been a lot of parents who use their kids' personality as an excuse to not discipline. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we should take our kids' personality into consideration as we are disciplining them to make sure that we're disciplining them in the way that is most effectively going to bring about the modification in their heart and in their behavior that we're trying to bring about. By the way, if you have one of those strong children that I just recommended, or that I just mentioned, then I would recommend to you a book called The Strong-Willed Child by Dr. James Dobson. The Strong-Willed Child by Dr. James Dobson. Another best practice I've seen is not only should we take our kids' personality into consideration as we discipline, but we should also take our own personality into consideration as we discipline our kids. If we happen to be angry, stern kind of people, then we may need to soften up a little bit in discipline. On the flip side, if we happen to be soft, gentle, lenient kind of people, then we may need to toughen up a little bit in our discipline. Another best practice that I've seen is we need to follow through as parents on the discipline that we assigned. In other words, we need to actually carry out the sentence that got delivered. Sometimes as parents, we deliver a discipline or we deliver a sentence, and then after a while, we kind of let up and back off on the sentence. Sometimes because we get tired, sometimes because we feel bad, sometimes because our kids wear us out. They keep begging for the, the discipline to be let up, or they keep complaining about the discipline, and so sometimes we sort of let up, right? But if the discipline we assigned was right, then we need to see it through. One thing I appreciated about my own parents is once they delivered a verdict, they stuck to it and nothing would change it. For example, I remember one time I got disciplined for a month. I was a bad 
Bad kid, by the way. And uh, I should have been disciplined for like a decade. But anyways, one time I got grounded for a month. I got grounded for a month. And it came to the last weekend of that grounding. And my best friend, uh, him and his family were going on a trip to the beach. And they asked if I could come with them. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm finishing up this month of being grounded. And so the dad, my best friend's dad, actually called my mom, which was probably a bad decision. But my best friend's dad called my mom and asked her if I could go to the beach with him. I mean, after all, I had already served 28 days of my 30-day sentence. So, I mean, wasn't I pretty much done? Couldn't she just let up a little bit and let me go to the beach? And she said, no. I had been grounded for a month. I would finish out the month. I would serve out my sentence, right? Now, notice that I said that we should follow through if we were right. There have been times where I've delivered a discipline to my children, and then some new information came to light, or some new witness came forward with some new information to bring to light. And sometimes I realized, okay, I made a mistake on the discipline that I assigned. So there have been times where I went back and changed a wrong discipline. But going back and adjusting the punishment because I was wrong is different than giving up on a punishment when I was right. Another best practice is don't forget to teach as you discipline. Sometimes we just discipline them and forget to actually teach them, right? To teach them what God's Word says, to teach them how they could have done better next time. Um, I want to recommend a good book that is all about teaching in the process of discipline. It is called Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. And it was actually one of my assigned textbooks in seminary. So it's a good book. Now another one that I want to try to encourage us parents on for a few seconds here is another best practice of disciplining our kids is this. Are you ready? Don't give up. Don't give up. I'm guessing every parent in this room has had those moments where they're sort of tempted to give up, right? But discipline takes time. Disciplining our kids is more like a crock pot than it is a microwave. It takes years and decades to raise a child. And so sometimes it takes years and decades to really start seeing the benefit of the good decisions we're making as parents. Not only does parenting takes time, but parenting also takes patience. I mean, imagine how much patience it would take to teach a kid how to play the piano. It would take painstaking patience of lesson after lesson, multiple times a week for years and decades to teach a kid how to play the piano. Well, guess what? What we're doing as parents is significantly more complicated than trying to teach a kid how to learn the piano. We are trying to teach our kids to grow up to be kind, responsible, godly adults. And that doesn't happen overnight. Not only does, pa does parenting take patience, parenting also takes faith. Faith means believing in something you can't see. And you know what? When you're disciplining a kid, you don't always see results right away. So a lot of times, we have to choose to believe what God's Word tells us is best even when we don't see that it's working in the short term. Not only does discipline take faith, it also takes wisdom. Wisdom chooses long-term gain over short-term pain. It takes long-term gain even when there's short-term pain involved. And you know what? It would be easier in the short term, it would be easier in the moment not to discipline our kids. But you know what? It's not easier in the long run. Now, this next best practice I want to spend a lot of time on, because this is a significant problem in our culture today, that as we discipline our kids, we should back up the authorities in their life, even when we may not fully agree with those authorities. Because here's the problem. If we teach our kids that the only time they have to obey their authorities is when they like the decisions their authorities are making, then what's going to happen when the day rolls around where they don't like the decision we're making within their life, right? That's a problem. Because a lot of parents spent years teaching them that they only have to obey their authorities if they like what their authorities are doing. But if they don't like what their authorities are doing, then they don't have to obey them anymore. Well, kid gets old enough and they start going, well, wait a minute. 
my parents are my authorities and I don't always like what they're doing, so maybe I don't have to obey them, right? So we're in trouble if we get to that point. So what do I mean by the authorities in their life? Well, for example, we should back up our kids' coaches. This is almost proverbial that parents undermine the authority of their kids' coaches, but we should back them up. Let me give you a radical example of some parents backing up their kids' coaches. When my wife was in school, she was on the JV cheerleading squad. And the varsity cheerleading squad was going on an exciting competition trip to Knott's Berry Farm. But they were one person short. And so they asked, oh, let me back up. Actually, I got that wrong a little bit. So the varsity team was going on this exciting trip to Knott's Berry Farm. And on the team was the coach's daughter and also the coach's daughter's best friend, okay? Well, in order to go to Knott's Berry Farm, they had, a, they had strict rules that you had to make a certain amount of practices. And there were some practices you couldn't miss, that if you missed those practices, you would not go to Knott's Berry Farm. And so what happened was the coach's daughter's best friend, after a while decided she was getting tired of all those grueling practices, and so she decided to quit. So she told, the, she told her best friend's mom, the coach, that she quit. So now they were one person short. So the varsity coach went to my wife and said, would you please step up to varsity so that we can be able to go compete at this exciting big competition at Knott's Berry Farm? And so Faith said, sure. Well, there was still six months before the competition. For six months, Faith went to every practice. She did all the grueling workouts. She learned every single routine. Then, the week before the competition, that coach's daughter's best friend decided that she wanted to be back on the team now because they were going to the exciting big competition at Knott's Berry Farm. So the coach, despite the rules and despite the supposed mandatory practices, allowed her daughter's best friend to rejoin the team, which meant, which meant that Faith had to get kicked off the team. So the coach told Faith, you know, she didn't say it exactly this way, but basically what she was saying is, sorry, I know you've done all the work for six months. My daughter's best friend who hasn't done any of the work is coming back on the team, and so now you're kicked off the team. Uh, keep in mind, it was so close that her par parents had already bought the tickets um, to Knott's Berry Farm and already gotten the hotel room, right? So Faith's dad was not happy about the situation, but do you know what Faith's parents did about it? Nothing. Nothing. They told her, they said, we think your coach is wrong, but your coach is the authority in your life, and so we are gonna respect your coach's authority. Now, the night before the competition, that varsity coach knocked on Faith's home door. And so Faith and, and her parents let the coach in, and the coach said, uh, I just found something out, I didn't know this, but one of the rules about the big, exciting competition at Knott's Berry Farm is that you have to have a backup flyer, you have to have an alternate in case someone gets hurt. And so she said, um, could Faith come and be the alternate since she already knows the routines? Now, Faith and her parents, oh boy, they could have rubbed it in, right? They could have said, so let me get this straight. When you needed Faith six months ago to keep the competition alive, she helped you. And now you need her again to help you because you put your daughter's best friend into the starting lineup even though they didn't go to any of the practices you said were mandatory. So they could have rubbed it in her face. Did they do that? No. They said, okay, sure. And so Faith went and sat in the bleachers and watched everybody else compete in the big, exciting competition at Knott's Berry Farm, including the coach's daughter's best friend, who did not do the practices he was supposed to do. Now, end of the story, afterwards, the coach actually came back to Faith and her parents and apologized and said, what I did was wrong. And she said, I am so impressed by how gracious you guys were throughout this whole thing. So here's the thing. The lesson that Faith learned that day was more important than anything that would have happened if she had actually competed in the competition. We should back up our kids' coaches. We should also back up our kids' teachers. <laughs> All right, there is a pandemic right now, a different pandemic than you're thinking about. There is a pandemic of parents who think that their kids must always be right and that the teacher must always be wrong. There is a pandemic of parents who think that there is no possible way that their precious little kid could actually be behaving as badly as the teacher says they are. My daughter Zoe's school would give an award at the end of each year 
for any kids who went through the entire year without getting their clip moved out. What that meant was in each classroom there was a behavior chart, and if you were good, your clip moved up, if you were bad, your clip moved down. And so it was getting close to the end of the year, and my daughter was so excited because she had gone through the entire year without getting her clip moved out. And so she could not wait to get this award at the end of the year for never getting her clip moved out. Then there came a day where there was a substitute teacher in her class. And the substitute teacher got frustrated with the class, and so the, um, the substitute teacher decided to move the entire class's clip down. He just said, that's it. I'm sick of you kids. I'm moving the whole class's clip down. Now, here's the trick. My daughter wasn't even in the class at the time she was at an orthodontist appointment. But the administration of the school said it doesn't matter. Any kid who gets their clip moved down for any reason by any teacher cannot get the award at the end of the year. So you know what Faith and I did? Nothing. We just told her, we think your school is wrong, but your school is the authority, and so we're going to back them up. We should back up our kids' coaches. We should back up our kids' teachers. We should back up our kids' pastors, all right? Um, parents, <laughs> this, one, this one is self-serving here. Um, parents often try to threaten and intimidate pastors into breaking the rules for their kids. Instead of teaching their kids to respect the role that pastors can play within their life. Parents, you do not want to undermine your kid's pastor's authority within their life. There's going to come a day you need that pastor's backup and you don't want to have undermined their authority. Another best practice is this, that we should be careful not to provoke our kids to wrath. What does that mean? Well, most parents in the United States are honestly probably in danger of being too soft, but for some, there is the danger of being too harsh. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. It says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So, how do we provoke our children to wrath? I think there's a lot of ways. One of the ways I think we can provoke our children to wrath is when we're too harsh in our discipline. Now, there are, of course, exceptions to what I'm about to say. But often, it is the father who can tend to be too harsh in their discipline. In fact, it's interesting that verse 4 was specifically addressed to fathers, right? Now, as a father myself, here's an indicator that I try to pay attention to as I'm disciplining my kids. If my kids are happier, more respectful, and more obedient after I discipline them, then I'm probably disciplining correctly. If, however, my kids are just as bad or worse after I discipline them, then I'm probably making one of two errors. I'm either being too soft or I'm being too harsh. But either way, I need to adjust and get the balance right. Let me hurry through the last uh, two tonight because I've been uh, getting carried away. Uh, but the second reason that we should discipline our kids is because they need it. All right, look with me at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 15. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Now, our, our culture increasingly is saying that could, kids should just be left to themselves, and that if you just leave them to themselves, and let them develop their own will, and let them figure out life on their own, that they will become happy, kind, helpful adults, right? Um, but this proverb actually says that kids left to their loan, you know, left to themselves bring disaster. Dr. Benjamin Spock was a, you know, a parenting professional 50, 60 years ago who led the way. He really started the modern parenting philosophy of just kind of don't discipline your kids and leave them alone and they'll turn out great. And he said this, he said, kids don't have to be disciplined into adulthood, but can direct themselves towards adulthood by following their own will. <laughs> yeah, right, sure they will. And yet, this has sort of become the dominant parenting philosophy of American culture. Now, these kind of beliefs have been gaining more and more acceptance over the last seven years. But ladies and gentlemen, the proof is in the pudding. 
Let me ask you, in the decades since these kind of modern parenting philosophies have been taking hold, are kids today more or less behaved than they used to be? Are kids today more or less respectful than they used to be? Are kids today more criminal or less criminal than they used to be? Are there more teenage pregnancies or less than there used to be? Are kids today doing more drugs or less drugs than they used to be? How about this one? Are kids today more or less Christian than they used to be, right? Okay, the third and final reason we should discipline our kids is because they're fallen. They're fallen. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15. It says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Modern parenting experts say that children are blank slates when they're born. And that discipline is actually the thing that puts bad behavior into kids' hearts. However, the Bible says that the bad behavior was in their hearts from day one. That they were born that way because all of us are born fallen. We're all born with a sinful nature. We're all born bent towards sin. And so this proverb reminds us that discipline is not what puts badness in the heart of a child. Careful, thoughtful, loving discipline is actually one of the tools God has given us to help drive out some of that bad behavior from their hearts. Now tonight we have barely even scratched the surface when it comes to disciplining our children. If you want to dig deeper, then I would recommend probably the number one Christian classic on um, disciplining, which is a book by Dr. James Dobson called Dare to Discipline. So it's been in print for who knows how long. It's, it's sort of the standard Christian uh, classic. So tonight, we've seen that we should discipline our kids because we love them. We should discipline our kids because they need it. And we should discipline our kids because they're fallen. Now, the last evidence in the Bible that careful, thoughtful, loving discipline is a good thing is the fact that the Bible says that God himself disciplines his children, right? In fact, the Bible teaches that's one of the ways that we know that we're God's children is if he disciplines us. Perhaps tonight you are a prodigal child. Perhaps tonight you are one of God's children, but you've gotten away from God. And maybe you're even going through a time of discipline within your life. I want to let you know that God loves you and that he wants you to come home to him. Maybe tonight, however, you're not a child of God. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. Well, I want to let you know that God loves you and that he sent Jesus to die for your sins and that he sent Jesus so that you could be included into the family of God and become a child of God. And what it takes is to recognize that we've sinned, to turn away from our old life, and to believe in Jesus with all of our heart, that he really is the Son of God, that he really did die on the cross, and that he really did come back from the dead. And so if you've never made that decision, please, I want to beg you, don't wait another second to make the best, most important decision you'll ever make. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for my mom and for my grandparents, Lord, who disciplined me. And God, I thank you, Lord, that it was always loving and careful and thoughtful. God, I pray for all of us, starting with myself, that, Lord, you would give us parents wisdom and endurance when it comes to disciplining. Lord, raising kids is so hard, and it's not always clear what the right thing to do is in a disciplinary situation. And so, God, please, Lord, give us wisdom. Help us to love our kids and to put their needs ahead of our own ease. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.